A Gent from Bear Creek by Robert Howard. The folks on Bear Creek ain't what you'd call peaceable by nature, but I was kind of surprised to come on to Erath Elkins and his brother-in-law, Joel Gordon, locked in mortal combat on the bank of the creek. But there they was, so tangled up they couldn't use their buoys to no advantage, and their cussin' was scandalous to hear. Remonstrances being useless, I kicked their knives out of their hands and throwed them bodily into the creek. That broke their holds, and they come swarming out with bloodthirsty shrieks and dripping whiskers and attacked me. Since they was too blind mad to have any sense, I bashed their heads together till they was too dizzy to do anything but holler. Is this any way for relatives to act? I asked disgustedly. Let me at him, howled Joel, gnashing his teeth whilst blood streamed down his whiskers. He's broke three of my fangs, and I'll have his life. Stand aside, Breckenridge, raved Erath. No man can chaw a ear off of me and live to tell the tale. Ah, shut up, I snorted. One more yap out of either n ye, and I'll see if your fool heads are harder than this. I brandished a fist under their noses, and they quieted down. Now, what's all this about? I demanded. I just discovered my brother in law is a thief, said Joel bitterly. At that, Erath gave a howl and a violent plunge to get at his relative, but I kind of pushed him backwards, and he fell over a willer stump. The facts is, Breckenridge, said Joel, me and this polecat found a buckskin poke full of gold nuggets in a holler oak over on a patchy ridge yesterday. We didn't know whether somebody in these parts had just hid it there for safekeeping, or whether some old prospector had left it there a long time ago, and maybe got sculped by the engines and never come back to get it. We agreed to leave it alone for a month, and if it was still there at that time, we'd feel pretty sure that the original owner was dead, and we'd split the gold between us. Well, last night I got to worrying somebody'd find it which wasn't as honest as me, so this morning I thought I'd better go see if it was still there. At this point, Erath laughed bitterly. Joel glared at him ominously, and continued, Well, no sooner I hove in sight of the holler tree than this skunk let go at me from the brush with a rifle gun. That's a lie, yelped Erath. It were just the other way around. Not being armed, Breckenridge, Joel said with dignity, and realizing that this coyote was trying to murder me so he could claim all the gold, I legged it for home and my weapons, and presently I sighted him sprinting through the brush after me. Erath began to foam slightly at the mouth. I weren't chasing you, he said. I was going home after my rifle gun. What's your story, Erath? I inquired. Last night I dreamt somebody had stole the gold, he answered sullenly. This morning I went to see if it was safe. Just as I got to the tree, this murderer begun shooting at me with a Winchester. I run for my life, and by some chance I finally run right into him. Likely he thought he'd killed me and was coming for the skull. Did either one of you see Tothern shoot at you? I asked. How could I, with him hid in the brush? snapped Joel. But who else could it been? I didn't have to see him, growled Erath. I felt the wind of his slug. But each one of you says he didn't have no rifle, I said. He's a cussed liar, they accused simultaneous, and would have fell on each other tooth and nail if they could have got past my bolt. I'm convinced they's been a mistake, I said. Get home and cool off. You're too big for me to lick, Breckenridge, said Erath, but I warn you, if you can't prove to me it wasn't Joel which tried to murder me, I ain't gonna rest nor sleep nor eat 
till I've nailed his mangy sculp to the highest pine on a patchy ridge. That goes for me, too, said Joel, grinding his teeth. I'm declaring true till tomorrow morning. If Breckenridge can't show me by then that you didn't shoot at me, either my wife or yourn'll be a widder before midnight. So saying, they stalked off in opposite directions, whilst I stared helplessly after them, slightly dazed at the responsibility which had been dumped onto me. That's the drawback of being the biggest man in your settlement. All the relatives pile their troubles onto you. Here it was up to me to stop what looked like the beginnings of a regular family feud, which was bound to reduce the population awful. The more I thought of the gold them idiots had found, the more I felt like I ought to go and take a look to see was it the real stuff. So I went back to the corral and saddled Captain Kidd and lit out for Apache Ridge, which was about a mile away. From the remarks they let fall whilst cussing each other, I had a pretty good idea where the holler oak was at, and sure enough I found it without much trouble. I tied Captain Kidd and clumb up on the trunk till I reached the holler. Then, as I was craning my neck to look in, I heard a voice say, Another darn thief! I looked around and seen Uncle Jeffrey Grimes pointing a gun at me. Mayor Creek is going to hell, said Uncle Jeffrey. First it was Erath and Joel, and now it's you. I'm going to throw a bullet through your hind leg just to teach you a little honesty. With that, he started sighting along the barrel of his Winchester, and I said, You better save your lead for that engine over there. Him being an old Indian fighter, he just naturally jerked his head around quick, and I pulled my forty-five and shot the rifle out of his hands. I jumped down and put my foot on it, and he pulled a knife out of his boot, and I'd taken it away from him and shaken him, till he was so addled when I let him go, he run in a circle and fell down, cussing something terrible. Is everybody on Bear Creek gone crazy, I demanded. Can't a man look into a holler tree without getting assassinated? You was after my gold, swore Uncle Jeffrey. So it's your gold, eh? I said. Well, a holler tree ain't no bank. I know it, he growled, combing the pine needles out of his whiskers. When I come here early this morning to see if it was safe like I frequent does, I seen right off somebody'd been handling it. Whilst I was meditating over this, I seen Joel Gordon sneaking toward the tree. I fired a shot across his boughs in warning, and he run off. But a few minutes later, here comes Erath Elkins slithering through the pines. I was mad by this time. So I combed his whiskers with a chunk of lead, and he hightailed it. And now, by golly, here you come. I don't want your blame gold, I roared. I just wanted to see if it was safe. And so did Joel and Erath. If them men was thieves, they'd a took it when they found it yesterday. Where'd you get it, anyway? I panned it up in the hills, he said sullenly. I ain't had time to take it to Chaudier and get it changed into cash money. I figured this here tree was as good a place as any, but I done put it elsewhere now. Well, I said, you gotta go tell Erath and Joel it was you shot at em, so they won't kill each other. They'll be mad at you, but I'll cool em off, maybe with a hickory club. All right, he said. I'm sorry I misjudged you, Breckenridge. Just to show you I trust you. I'll show you whar I hid it. He led me through the trees till he came to a big rock jutting out from the side of a cliff and pointed to a smaller stone wedged beneath it. I pulled out that rock, he said, and dug a hole and stuck the poke in. Look. He heaved the rock out and bent down. Then he went straight up in the air with a yell that made me jump and pull my gun with cold sweat, busting out all over me. What's the matter with you, I demanded. Are you snake bit? Yeah, by human snakes, he hollered. It's gone. I've been robbed. I looked and seen the impressions the wrinkles and the buckskin poke had made in the soft earth. 
But there wasn't nothing there now. Uncle Jeopard was doing a scalp dance with a gun in one hand and a bowie knife in the other. I'll fringe my leggings with their mangy sculps, he raved. I'll pickle their hearts on a barrel of brine. I'll feed their livers to my hound dogs. Whose livers, I inquired. Whose, you idiot, he howled. Joel Gordon and Erath Elkins, darn it, they didn't run off. They snuck back here and seen me move the gold. I've killed better men than them for half as much. Ah, I said, taint possible they stole your gold. Then where is it? he demanded bitterly. Who else knowed about it? Look here, I said, pointing to a belt of soft loam near the rocks. A horse's tracks. What of it? he demanded. Maybe they had horses tied in the brush. Ah, no, I said. Look how the Calkins is set. They ain't no horses on Bear Creek shod like that. These is the tracks of a stranger. I bet the feller I seen ride past my cabin just about daybreak. A black whiskered man with one ear missing. That hard ground by the big rock don't show where he got off and stomped around. But the man which rode this horse stole your gold. I'll bet my guns. I ain't convinced, said Uncle Jeopard. I'm going home and I'll my rifle gun. Then I'm going to go over and kill Joel and Erath. Now you listen, I said forcibly. I know what a stubborn old jassick you are, Uncle Jeopard, but this time you got to listen to reason or I'll forget myself and kick the seat out of your britches. I'm going to follow this feller and take your gold away from him because I know it was him stole it. And don't you dare to kill nobody till I get back. I'll give you till tomorrow morning, he compromised. I won't pull a trigger till then. But, said Uncle Jeopard, waxing poetical, if my gold ain't in my hands, by the time the morning sun heists itself o'er the shining peaks of the jackass mountains, the buzzards'll rassle their hash on the carcasses of Joel Gordon and Erath Elkins. I went away from there, mounted Captain Kidd, and headed west on the trail of the stranger. It was still tolerably early in the morning, and one of them long summer days ahead of me. They wasn't a horse in the Humboldts equal to Captain Kidd for endurance. I've rode a hundred miles on him between sundown and sun up. But that horse the stranger was riding must have been some chunk of horse meat hisself. The day wore on, and still I hadn't come up with my man. I was getting into country I wasn't familiar with, but I didn't have much trouble in following the trail, and finally, late in the evening, I come out on a narrow, dusty path where the caulk marks of his hoofs was very plain. The sun sunk lower, and my hopes dwindled. Captain Kidd was beginning to tire, and even if I got the thief and got the gold, it'd be an awful push to get back to Bear Creek in time to prevent mayhem. But I urged on Captain Kidd, and presently we come out onto a road and the tracks I was following merged with a lot of others. I went on, expecting to come to some settlement and wondering just where I was. I'd never been that far in that direction before then. Just at sundown I rounded a bend in the road and seen something hanging to a tree, and it was a man. There was another man in the act of pinning something to the corpse's shirt, and when he heard me he wheeled and jerked his gun. The man, I mean, not the corpse. He was a mean-looking cuss, but he wasn't black whiskers. Seeing I made no hostile move, he put up his gun and grinned. That feller's still kicking, I said. We just strung him up, said the fellow. The other boys has rode back to town, but I stayed to put this warning on his bosom. Can you read? No, I said. Well, he said, this here paper says, warning to all outlaws, and specially them on Grizzly Mountain. Keep away from Wampum. How far is Wampum from here? I asked. Half a mile down the road, he said. I'm Al Jackson, one of Bill Orman's deputies. We aim to clean up Wampum. This is one of them durned outlaws which is dinned up on Grizzly Mountain. Before I could say anything, 
I heard somebody breathing quick and gaspy, and they was a patter of bare feet in the brush, and a kid girl about fourteen years old bust into the road. You've killed Uncle Joab, she shrieked. You murderers! A boy told me they was fixin' to hang him. I run as fast as I could. Get away from that corpse, roared Jackson, hitting at her with his quirt. You stop that, I ordered. Don't you hit that young'un. Oh, please, mister, she wept, wringing her hands. You ain't one of Orman's men. Please help me. He ain't dead. I seen him move. Waiting for no more, I spurred alongside the body and drawed my knife. Don't you cut that rope, squawked the deputy, jerking his gun. So I hit him under the jaw and knocked him out of his saddle and into the brush beside the road where he lay groaning. I then cut the rope and eased the hanged man down onto my saddle and got the noose off his neck. He was purple in the face and his eyes was closed and his tongue lolled out, but he still had some life in him. Evidently they didn't drop him, but just hauled him up to strangle to death. I laid him on the ground and worked over him till some of his life begun to come back to him, but I knowed he ought to have medical attention. I said, where's the nearest doctor? Doc Richards in Wampum, whispered the kid. But if we take him there, Orman will get him again. Won't you please take him home? Where you all live, I inquired. We've been living in a cabin on Grizzly Mountain since Orman run us out of Wampum, she whimpered. Well, I said, I'm going to put your uncle on Captain Kidd, and you can sit behind the saddle and help hold him on, and tell me which way to go. So I done so, and started off on foot, leading Captain Kidd in the direction the girls showed me. And as we went, I seen the deputy Jackson drag himself out of the brush and go limping down the road, holding his jaw. I was losing an awful lot of time, but I couldn't leave this feller to die, even if he was an outlaw, because probably the little gal didn't have nobody to take care of her but him. Anyway, I'd never make it back to Bear Creek by daylight on Captain Kidd, even if I could have started right then. It was well after dark when we come out on a narrow trail that wound up a thickly timbered mountainside, and pretty soon somebody in a thicket ahead of us hollered, Halt where you be, or I'll shoot. Don't shoot, Jim, called the girl. This is Ellen, and we're bringing Uncle Joab home. A tall, hard-looking young feller stepped out in the open, still biting his Winchester at me. He cussed when he seen our load. He ain't dead, I said, but we ought to get him to his cabin. So Jim led me through the thickets until we come to a clearing where there was a cabin, and a woman come running out and screamed like a catamount when she seen Joab. Me and Jim lifted him off and carried him in and laid him on a bunk and the women began to work over him and I went out to my horse because I was in a hurry to get gone. Jim followed me. This is the kind of stuff we've been having ever since Orman come to Wampum, he said bitterly. We've been living up here like rats, afeard to stir in the open. I warned Joab against slipping down into the village today, but he was sought on it and wouldn't let any of the boys go with him. Said he'd sneak in, get what he wanted, and sneak out again. Well, I said, what's your business is none of mine, but this here life is hard lines on women and children. You must be a friend of Joab's, he said. He sent a man east some days ago, but we was afraid one of Orman's men trailed him and killed him. But maybe he got through. Are you the man Joab sent for? Meaning, am I some gunman come in to clean up the town? I snorted. Nah, I ain't. I never seen this fella Joab before. Well, said Jim, cutting down Joab like you done has already got you in bad with Orman. Help us run them fellers out of the country. There's still a good many of us in these hills, even if we have been run out of wampum. This hanging is a last straw. I'll round up the boys tonight and we'll have a showdown with Orman's men. We're outnumbered, and we've been licked bad once, but we'll try again. Won't you throw in with us? Listen, I said, climbing into the saddle. Just because I cut down an outlaw ain't no sign I'm ready to be one myself. I done it just because I couldn't stand to see the little girl take on so. Anyway, I'm looking for a feller with black whiskers and one ear missing, which rides a roan, 
with a big, lazy A brand. Jim fell back from me and lifted his rifle. You better ride on, he said somberly. I'm obliged to you for what you did, but a friend of Wolf Ashley can't be no friend of ourn. I gave him a snort of defiance and rode off down the mountain and headed for Wampum, because it was reasonable to suppose that maybe I'd find black whiskers there. Wampum wasn't much of a town, but they was one big saloon and gambling hall where sounds of hilarity was coming from, and not many people on the streets, and them which was, mostly went in a hurry. I stopped one of them and asked him where a doctor lived. He pointed out a house where he said Doc Richards lived. So I rode up to the door and knocked, and somebody inside said, What do you want? I got you covered. Are you Doc Richards, I said. He said, Yes. Keep your hands away from your belt, or I'll fix you. This is a nice, friendly town, I snorted. I ain't figuring on harming you. There's a man up in the hills which needs your attention. At that, the door opened, and a man with red whiskers and a shotgun stuck his head out and said, Who do you mean? They call him Joab, I said. He's on Grizzly Mountain. Hmm, said Doc Richards, looking at me very sharp, where I sought Captain Kidd in the starlight. I set a man's jaw tonight, and he had a lot to say about a certain party who cut down a man that was hanged. If you're that party, my advice to you is to hit the trail before Ormond catches you. I'm hungry and thirsty, and I'm looking for a man, I said. I aim to leave Wampum when I'm good and ready. I never argue with a man as big as you, said Doc Richards. I'll ride to Grizzly Mountain as quick as I can get my horse saddled. If I never see you alive again, which is very probable, I'll always remember you as the biggest man I ever saw and the biggest fool. Good night. I thought, the folks in Wampum is the queerest actin' I ever seen. I took my horse to the barn, which served as a livery stable, and seen that he was properly fixed. Then I went into the big saloon, which was called the Golden Eagle. I was low in my spirits, because I seemed to have lost Black Whiskers' trail entirely, and even if I found him in Wampum, which I hoped, I never could make it back to Bear Creek by sun-up. But I hoped to recover that darn gold yet and get back in time to save a few lives. They was a lot of tough-looking fellers in the Golden Eagle, drinking and gambling and talking loud and cussing, and they all stopped their noise as I come in, and looked at me very fishy. But I'd give them no heed, and went to the bar, and pretty soon they kind of forgot about me, and the racket started up again. Whilst I was drinking me a few fingers of whiskey, somebody shouldered up to me and said, Hey! I turned around and seen a big, broad-built man with a black beard and bloodshot eyes, and a pot belly with two guns on. I said, Well... Who are you? he demanded. Oh, who are you? I came back at him. I'm Bill Orman, Sheriff of Wampum, he said. That's who? And he showed me a star on his shirt. Oh, I said. Well, I'm Breckenridge Elkins from Bear Creek. I noticed a kind of quiet come over the place, and fellows was laying down their glasses and their billiard sticks and hitching up their belts and kind of gathering around me. Orman scowled and combed his beard with his fingers and rocked on his heels and said, I got to rest you. I sought down my glass quick and he jumped back and hollered, Don't you dast draw no gun on the law. And there was a kind of movement among the men around me. What you arresting me for, I demanded. I ain't busted no law. You assaulted one of my deputies, he said. And then I saw that feller Jackson standing behind the sheriff with his jaw all bandaged up. He couldn't work his chin to talk. All he could do was pint his finger at me and shake his fists. You likewise cut down a outlaw we had just hung, he said Orman. You're under arrest. But I'm looking for a man, I protested. I ain't got time to be arrested. You should have thunk about that when you busted the law, opined Orman. Give me your gun and come along peaceable. A dozen men had their hands on their guns, but... It wasn't that which made me give in. Pap had always taught me never to resist no officer of the law, so it was kind of instinctive for me to hand my gun over to Ormond and go along with him without no fight. I was kind of bewildered, and my thoughts was addled anyway. I ain't one of these fast-thinking sharps. 
Ormond escorted me down the street a ways with a whole bunch of men following us, and stopped at a log building with barred windows, which was next to a board shack. A man come out of this shack with a big bunch of keys, and Ormond said he was the jailer. So they put me in the log jail, and Ormond went off with everybody but the jailer, who sat down on the step outside the shack and rolled a cigarette. There wasn't no light in the jail, but I found the bunk and tried to lay down on it, but it wasn't built for a man six and a half feet tall. I sat down on it, and at last realized what an infernal mess I was in. Here I ought to be hunting black whiskers and getting the gold to take back to Bear Creek and save the lives of a lot of my kinfolks, but instead I was in jail, and no way of getting out without killing an officer of the law. With daybreak, Joel and Erath would be at each other's throats, and Uncle Jeffrey had be gunning for both of them. It was too much to hope that the other relatives would let them three fight it out amongst their selves. I'd never seen such a clan for butting in to each other's business. The guns would be talking all up and down Bear Creek, and the population would be decreasing with every volley. I thought about it till I got dizzy, and then the jailer stuck his head up to the window and said if I would give him five dollars, he'd go get me something to eat. I give it to him, and he went off and was gone quite a spell, and at last he come back and gave me a ham sandwich. I asked him was that all he could get for five dollars, and he said grub was awful high in wampum. I ate the sandwich in one bite because I hadn't et nothing since morning. Then he said if I'd give him some more money, he'd get me another sandwich, but I didn't have no more, and told him so. What? he said, breathing liquor fumes in my face through the window bars. No money? And you expect us to feed you for nothing? So he cussed me and went off. Pretty soon the sheriff come and looked in at me and said, What's this I hear about you not having no money? I ain't got none left, I said, and he cussed something fierce. How you expect to pay your fine? he demanded. You think you can lay up in our jail and eat us out of house and home? What kind of critter are you, anyway? Just then the jailer chipped in and said somebody told him I had a horse down at the livery stable. Good, said the sheriff. We'll sell the horse for his fine. No, you won't, neither, I said, beginning to get mad. You try to sell Captain Kidd, and I'll forget what Pap told me about officers and take you plumb apart. I riz up and glared at him through the window, and he fell back and put a hand on his gun but just about that time I seen a man going into the Golden Eagle, which was an easy side of the jail, and lit up, so the light streamed out into the street. I give a yell that made Ormond jump about a foot. It was Black Whiskers. Arrest that man, Sheriff, I hollered. He's a thief. Ormond whirled and looked, and then said, Are you plumb crazy? That's Wolf Ashley, my deputy. I don't give a dern, I said. He stole a poke of gold from my Uncle Jeppard up in the Humboldts, and I've trailed him clean from Bear Creek. Do your duty and arrest him. You shut up, roared Orman. You can't tell me my business. I ain't going to arrest my best gunman, my star deputy, I mean. What you mean trying to start trouble this way? One more yap out of you, and I'll throw a chunk of lead through you. And he turned and stalked off, muttering, Poke of gold, huh? Holdin' out on me, is he? I'll see about that. I sat down and held my head in bewilderment. What kind of sheriff was this which wouldn't arrest a dern thief? My thoughts ran in circles till my wits was addled. The jailer had gone off, and I wondered if he went to sell Captain Kidd. I wondered what was going on back at Bear Creek, and I shivered to think what would bust loose at daybreak. And here I was in jail, with them fellers fixin' to sell my horse whilst the dern thief swaggered round at large. I looked helplessly out the window. It was getting late, but the Golden Eagle was still going full blast. I could hear the music blaring away, and the fellers yippin' and shootin' their pistols in the air, and their boot heels stompin' on the boardwalk. I felt like bustin' down and cryin', and then I begun to get mad. I get mad slowly, generally. And before I was plumb mad, I heard a noise at the window. I seen a pale face staring in at me and a couple of small white hands on the bars. Oh, mister, a voice whispered. Mister. I stepped over and looked out, and it was the kid girl, Ellen. What you doing here, gal? I asked. 
Doc Richards said you was in Wampum, she whispered. He said he was afraid Orman and his gang would go for you, because you helped me, so I slipped away on his horse and rode here as hard as I could. Jim was out trying to gather up the boys for a last stand, and Aunt Rachel and the other women are busy with Uncle Joab. They wasn't nobody but me to come, but I had to. You saved Uncle Joab, and I don't care if Jim does say you're an outlaw because you're a friend of Wolf Ashley's. Oh, I wished I wasn't just a girl. I wished I could shoot a gun so's I could kill Bill Ormond. That's no way for a gal to talk, I said. Leave killing to the men. But I appreciate you going to all this trouble. I got some kid sisters myself. In fact, I got seven or eight, as near as I can remember. Don't you worry none about me. Lots of men get throwed in jail. But that ain't it, she wept wringing her hands. I listened outside the window of the back room in the Golden Eagle and heard Orman and Ashley talking about you. I don't know what you wanted with Ashley when you asked Jim about him, but he ain't your friend. Orman accused him of stealing a poke of gold and holding out on him, and Ashley said it's a lie. Then Orman said you told him about it, and that he'd give Ashley till midnight to produce that gold, and if he didn't, Wampum would be too small for both of them. Then he went out, and I heard Ashley talking to a pal of his, and Ashley said he'd have to raise some gold somehow, or Ormond would have him killed, but that he was going to fix you, mister, for lying about him. Mister, Ashley and his bunch are over in the back of the Golden Eagle right now, plotting to bust into the jail before daylight and hang you. Oh, I said, the sheriff wouldn't let him do that. You don't understand, she cried. Ormond ain't the sheriff. Him and his gunmen come into Wampum and killed all the people that tried to oppose him or run him up in the hills. They got us pinned up there like rats, nigh starving and afeard to come to town. Uncle Joab come into Wampum this morning to get some salt, and you seen what they done to him. He's the real sheriff. Orman's just a bloody outlaw. Him and his gang is using Wampum for a hangout whilst they rob and steal and kill all over the country. Then that's what your friend Jim meant, I said slowly. And me, like a dumb damn fool, I thought him and Joab and the rest of you all was just outlaws, like that fake deputy said. Orman took Uncle Joab's badge and called himself the sheriff to fool strangers, she whimpered. What honest people is left in Wampum are afeard to oppose him. Him and his gunmen are ruling this whole part of the country. Uncle Joab sent a man east to get us some help in the settlements on Buffalo River, but none ever come. And from what I overheard tonight, I believe Wolf Ashley followed him and killed him over east of the Humboldt somewheres. What are we going to do? she sobbed. Ellen, I said, you get on Doc Richard's horse and ride for Grizzly Mountain. When you get there, tell the doc to head for Wampum, because there'll be plenty of work for him time he gets there. But what about you, she cried. I can't go off and leave you to be hanged. Don't worry about me, gal, I said. I'm Breckenridge Elkins of the Humboldt Mountains, and I'm preparing for to shake my mane. Hustle! Something about me evidently convinced her because she glided away, whimpering, into the shadows, and presently I heard the clack of horses' hoofs dwindling in the distance. I then riz, and I laid hold of the window bars, and I tore them out by the roots. Then I sunk my fingers into the sill log and tore it out, and three or four more, and the wall gave way entirely, and the roof fell down on me but I shook aside the fragments and heaved up out of the wreckage like a bear out of a deadfall. About this time the jailer come running up, and when he seen what I had did he was so surprised he forgot to shoot me with his pistol. So I'd taken it away from him and knocked down the door of his shack with him and left him laying in its ruins. I then strode up the street toward the Golden Eagle, and here come a feller galloping down the street. Who should it be but that dern fake deputy, Jackson? He couldn't holler with his bandaged jaw, but when he seen me, 
He jerked loose his lariat and piled it around my neck and sought spurs to his cayuse, aiming for to drag me to death. But I seen he had his rope tied fast to his horn, Texas style, so I laid hold on it with both hands and braced my legs. And when the horse got to the end of the rope, the girths busted, and the horse went out from under the saddle and Jackson come down on his head in the street and laid still. I throwed the rope off my neck and went on to the Golden Eagle with the jailer's forty-five in my scabbard. I looked in and seen the same crowd there, and Orman reared back at the bar with his belly stuck out, roaring and bragging. I stepped in and hollered, Look this way, Bill Orman, and pull iron, you dirty thief. He wheeled, paled, and went for his gun, and I slammed six bullets into him before he could hit the floor. I then throwed the empty gun at the day's crowd and gave one deafening roar and tore into em like a mountain cyclone. They begun to holler and surge onto me, and I throwed em and knocked em right and left like ten pins. Some was knocked over the bar and some under the tables, and some I knocked down stacks of beer kegs with. I ripped the roulette wheel loose and mowed down a whole row of em with it, and I throwed a billiard table through the mirror behind the bar just for good measure. Three or four fellers got pinned under it and yelled bloody murder. But I didn't have no time to unpin em, for I was busy elsewhere. Four of them hellions came at me in a flying wedge, and the only thing to do was give em a dose of their own medicine. So I put my head down and butted the first one in the belly. He gave a grunt you could hear across the mountains, and I grabbed the other three and squoze em together. I then flung em against the bar and headed into the rest of the mess of em. I felt so good I was yelling some. Come on, I yelled. I'm Brecken Ridge Elkins, and you got my dander roused. And I waded in and poured it to em. Meanwhile, they was hacking at me with buoys and hitting me with chairs and brass knuckles and trying to shoot me, but all they done with their guns was shoot each other, cause they was so many they got in each other's way. And the other things just made me madder. I laid hands on as many as I could hug at once, and the thud of their heads banging together was music to me. I also done good work heaving them head on against the walls, and I further slammed several of them hardly against the floor and busted all the tables with their carcasses. In the melee, the whole bar collapsed, and the shells behind the bar fell down when I slang a feller into them, and the bottles rained all over the floor. One of the lamps also fell off the ceiling, which was beginning to crack and cave in, and everybody begun to yell, Fire! and run out through the doors and jump out the windows. In a second, I was alone in the blazing building except for them which was past running. I'd started for an exit myself when I seen a buckskin pouch on the floor along with a lot of other belongings which had fell out of men's pockets the way they will when men get swung by the feet and smashed against the wall. I picked it up and jerked the tie string and a trickle of gold dust spilled into my hand. I begun to look on the floor for Ashley, but he wasn't there. But he was watching me from outside, because I looked and seen him just as he let Bam at me with a forty-five from the back room of the place, which wasn't yet on fire much. I plunged after him, ignoring his next slug, which took me in the shoulder, then I grabbed him and taken the gun away from him. He pulled a buoy and tried to stab me in the growin', but only sliced my thigh. So I throwed him the full length of the room, and he hit the wall so hard his head went through the boards. Meantime, the main part of the saloon was burning, so I couldn't go out that way. I started to go out the back door of the room I was in, but got a glimpse of some fellers which was crouching just outside the door, waiting to shoot me as I come out. So I knocked out a section of the wall on another side of the room, and about that time the roof fell in so loud them fellers didn't hear me coming. So I fell on em from the rear and beat their heads together till the blood ran out their ears and stomped them and took their shotguns away from em. One big fellow with a scarred face tackled me around the knees as I bent over to get the second gun, and a little man hopped on my shoulders from behind at the same time and began clawing like a catamount. That made me pretty mad again, but I still kept enough presence of mind not to lose my temper. I just grabbed the little man off and hit Scarface over the head with him, and after that none of the rest bothered me within handhold distance. Then I was aware that people was shooting at me in the light of the burning saloon, and I seen that a bunch was ganged up on the other side of the street. So I begun to loose my shotguns into the thick of them, and they broke and run, yelling blue murder. 
and as they went out one side of the town, another gang rushed in from the other, yelling and shooting, and I snapped an empty shell at him before one yelled, Don't shoot, Elkins. We're friends. And I seen it was Jim and Doc Richards, and a lot of other fellers I hadn't never seen before then. They went tearing around, looking to see if any of Orman's men was hiding in the village, but none was. They looked like all they wanted to do was get clean out of the country, so most of the Grizzly Mountain men took in after them, whooping and shouting. Jim looked at the wreckage of the jail and the remnants of the Gold Eagle, and he shook his head like he couldn't believe it. We was on our way to make a last effort to take the town back from the gang, he said. Ellen met us as we come down and told us you was a friend and an honest man. We hope to get here in time to save you from getting hanged. Again he shook his head with a kind of bewildered look. And then he said, Oh, say, I'd about forgot. On our way here we run on to a man on the road who said he was looking for you. Not knowing who he was, we roped him and brung him along with us. Bring the prisoner, boys. They brung him, tied to a saddle, and it was Jack Gordon, Joel's youngest brother and the fastest gunslinger on Bear Creek. What you doing here, I demanded bitterly. Has the feud begun already, and has Joel set you on my trail? Well, I got what I started after, and I'm heading back for Bear Creek. I can't get there by daylight, but maybe I'll get there in time to keep everybody from killing everybody else. Here's Uncle Jefford's cussed gold. And I waved the pouch in front of him. But that can't be it, he said. I've been trailing you all the way from Bear Creek, trying to catch you and tell you the gold had been found. Uncle Jeppard and Joel and Erath got together and everything was explained and is all right. Where'd you get that gold? I don't know if Ashley's pals got it together so he could give it to Ormond and not get killed for holding out on his boss, or what, I said. But I know that the owner ain't got no more use for it now and probably stole it in the first place. I'm giving this gold to Ellen, I said. She sure deserves a reward, and giving it to her makes me feel like maybe I accomplished something on this wild goose chase after all. Jim looked around at the ruins of the outlaw hangout and murmured something I didn't catch. I said to Jack, you said Uncle Jeffers' gold was found? Where was it anyway? Well, said Jack, little General William Harrison Grimes, Uncle Jeffers' youngest boy, he seen his pap put the gold under the rock and he got it out to play with. He was using the nuggets for slugs in his nigger shooter, Jack said, and it's plumb cute the way he pops a rattlesnake with him. Uh, what did you say? Nothing, I said between my teeth. Nothing that'd be fit to repeat, anyway. End of A Gent from Bear Creek